Dobro večer, dragi gledatelji. Dobrodošli još jedan, jedan na jedan. Večerašnja emisija bit će meni osobno posebno draga, posebno izazovna, jer nakon nekih 30 i nešto godina ponovo imamo u studiju bivšeg ambasadora, bivšeg veliposlanika u Republici Hrvatske, gospodina Viljama Montgomerija. Dobro večer i dobrodošli. Yes, thank you. Glad to be here. Radili smo jedan intervju u gotovo tehnički nemogućim uvjetima, ali tada je sve u Hrvatskoj bilo jako improvizirano, bila je u ratu i hvala vam lijepo evo što se pomoći. Mi smo se viđali naravno među vremenu, ali hvala lijepo što ste se odazili da budete i večeras naš gost. Spominjam ovo veliko razdoblje jer i vi nekako razmišljate o vašem životnom putu koje koincidira sa američkom politikom drugog druge polovice 20. stoljeća i početka ovog stoljeća. Pa svodite neke račune o toj politici, razmišljate je li trebalo baš tako, je li se moralo uvijek tako. Shvatio sam da tu važete, procenjujete tu politiku, ne samo zato što je ona američka, nego zato što je Amerika bila slovo vrijeme jedina vele sila. Te razmišljate naprosto globalno o povijesti svijeta u nas za 70 godina. Pa počnemo od početka te vaše karijere, tih vaših sjećanja i tih vaših introspekcija. Vratimo se u jednu neugodnu situaciju u Vjetnam. Vi ste tada sudjelovali u ratu i sasvim sigurno imate i bolne uspomene, ali ovako kad se odmaknete politički gledano, kako danas mislite o tom ratu i angažmanu SAD-a u tom ratu? Well, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I am starting to write a book about my diplomatic career, my life, and I am totally stuck on the first chapter, which is about Vietnam. And I've tried three times and I, I can't get it right. Um, I guess the, the most important thing, and I should say that, that I am reflecting on it more now, than I was 20, 30 years ago. Why? I'm not so sure. Uh, but um, the reality is that, that the first most important factor about Vietnam was that there was a, a real Cold War at that time between uh, the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies and NATO, the West. And this was real, and it wasn't just cold. That, that all over the world uh, we were competing with each other almost like on a chessboard to take pieces uh, uh, from the other one. And so uh, they would, they would uh, take uh, Castro, bring him to power in, in Cuba. We would do something somewhere else. And so our first thought when it came to, to Vietnam was this was another one of those situations where the Soviet Union, with uh, communist China helping them, were supporting uh, the North. And uh, therefore, we had to sort of support the South. That was the major, major factor. But that was uh, combined also, I think, with sadly, a little um, sense of superiority on our part in terms of our military and how we believe that uh, uh, it could win anywhere. And that the military factor was the only important factor, nothing else, uh, which was a huge mistake. And the, the uh, third mistake we made, um, and it's something that every, every world leader should think about a lot, is that people around the world think about things very differently. And so we were killing enormous numbers of uh, uh, North Vietnamese soldiers and Viet Cong. Um, at the end of the war, they announced that uh, over a million of their soldiers had been killed. Uh, and we only lost 58,000. And what our belief was, because we were looking at it from our point of view, mm -hmm. was that they would not be able to sustain this rate of casualties. Uh, they would have to stop. Um, and the irony is 
that they knew us better than we knew ourselves because it was our unwillingness to sustain 58,000 casualties when they were willing to accept any number to win. And that was a difference. And so uh, that, that's a very important factor. Um, so I think that is a, a lot of the reason why uh, we got involved. The sad thing is that, that uh, I went over there in 1968, uh, I was drafted. Um, and I got there around August of 68. Earlier that year, our Minister of Defense, later on, disclosed that he knew in early 1968 that we couldn't win in Vietnam. Uh, and so from the time that he realized that, we suffered more casualties than we had before his, his decision, his thought. Uh, but yet we kept fighting to save face for another four or five years. Na ovom primjeru, ja sam krenuo od Vjetnama, možda će se gledati ili začutiti zašto tako duboko jasno opravdanje je s toga što je to na neki način početak tih vaših memoara, ali tu je i temeljni uzorak do kojeg je meni stalo ove emisije. I na neki način ste već sada impostirali tu temu, a to je tema nerazumijevanja situacije u koju se ulazi nepotpunog shvaćanja sredine u kojoj se SAD angažira. Skočimo sada u 70-te. Vi dolazite u Jugoslaviju po prvi puta. Vi ste eksperti, znači za ovaj kraj bili ste veli poslanik u Hrvatskoj, bili ste u Bugarskoj, bili ste u Beogradu, je li tako, u Srbiji. Da sad ne navodim vaše ostale diplomatske aktivnosti, ali hoću kazati, znam, to je podneblje briljantno. No kad ste došli prvi puta, Pripremili ste se temeljito, čitali ste puno knjiga. Nažalost, samo američkih. Sad mi kažete, kad ste ustanovili da su te knjige bile nedovoljne i što to, recimo, niste razumjeli o Titovoj Jugoslaviji i Jugoslaviji uopće? The problem was, as I said before, about this massive cold war. And Tito was the right man in the right place at the right time for Yugoslavia. Because he did enough things that satisfied the Soviet Union. So for example, he was a dictator. Uh, there was uh, no free media. There was no free speech. Uh, there was only one political party. Yes, exactly. And at the same time, uh, he allowed ordinary people to have more freedoms, like the freedom to travel and other things. Um, that satisfied us. And uh, from our point of view, it was creating a potential wedge in, in Eastern Europe uh, when they saw how much better uh, off the Yugoslavs were than they were, that this would lead to unhappiness, et cetera. And so we didn't want to do anything to, to upset Tito. And he uh, made it very clear that we could have no contact with any so-called dissidents or, or anybody like that. And um, this put us in a, a strange position because we were there as diplomats, but we had almost no contact uh, with officials except in official meetings. Um, and no real way to, to gauge so much the attitude of the ordinary people. Um, and the fact of it is that, that we were trying to please Tito. And the books at that time all reflected a much more optimistic, uh, gentle, positive description of Tito than was really deserved. And, and if you read the books at that time, uh, they all uh, minimize the importance of ethnic groups uh, uh, in what happened in the past, and they all emphasize the future and the good changes that Tito is making and stuff like that. And, 
when I came, um, I realized that. I could see that. Uh, I knew that. I knew that things weren't as described. I didn't know enough to know what I should have. But, but uh, one of the main sources that I found incredibly interesting mm-hmm. uh, was uh, Milo Van Gilis. Gilis. Uh, I bought every book of his that was published. And Postovas, Omilien and Dissident. Yes. And he, but I couldn't meet with him. My ambassador wouldn't let me meet with him because that would have annoyed Tito. I thought that was Sunday said me. Yes, that, that would have annoyed Tito. So I was not allowed, even though I, I had two bitter discussions in working for Lawrence Eagleburger mm-hmm. in my entire life, because I worked for him as his chief of staff when he was secretary of state and deputy secretary, undersecretary of state, and when he's ambassador here. And the first bitter discussion was his refusal to allow me to see Gilles. Gilles uh, had a harsh uh, reputation from the Second World War, but he was a real intellectual. And, and I, I strongly recommend everybody to read. What is your as an American in Yugoslavia, especially u tim Đilasovim spisima. Što je bilo veliko otkriće Epifanija? Well, first of all, uh, two of his books, uh, the first, uh, Land Without Justice, and secondly, Memoirs of a Revolutionary, describe in great detail, in a very readable way, his upbringing and why he became a communist. And once he became a communist, how he got in touch with other communists when they were put in jail. Mm. And how that time in jail was actually what cemented their alliances and strengthened their resolve and led to their, their victory. Uh, and I also admire Gilles uh, uh, for the stand that he took. Uh, there's very few people in this world I've met who Uh, are willing to really say what they think, even at great political cost to themselves. And he did so. And when he wrote uh, The New Class, when he uh, <coughs> spoke up the way he did, and he knew he would anger Tito, but he did it anyway, even though it cost him all his positions in the party, got him thrown into jail a few times, he did it. And, and I admire people like that very, very much. Yeah, I'm really key. I pametni čovjek iz <coughs> Mississippija, vaš imenjak Faulkner, e, kazao je da prošlost nikad nije mrtva, da ona naprosto nije ni prošla. E, vi Amerikanci ipak unatoč tako velikanima i tako velikim mislima, ovo je zbilja sjajna misao, yeah. još bolje zvuči na engleskom, e, ne držite zapravo, vi ta tako mislite kao Amerikanac, e, do prošlosti. Zašto je tome tako? To nije to kako tako zato što ste vi eto, četiri stoljeća i pol stara e, država ili tako nešto, zato što bi mi evropljani mogli, ne znam, potegnuti <laughs> našu povijest. To je iz, naprosto drugih razloga. Vi ste okrenuti prema sadašnjici, prema sutrašnjici. Otkud, e, ili ovako, da postavim ovako pitanje, da li se te nesporazu kojem govorite sa sredinama kojem Amerika intervenira, zapravo dijelom temelji na tom na, e, nerazumijevanju ili nevojkosti da se po, pozabavite prošlosti e, sredina u koju ulazite? It's, it's actually a very perceptive question. Um, uh, the United States was founded uh, from other than Native Americans, nobody was there. And we had a, a huge continent with people from all countries wanting to take part of it. The British, the French, the Spanish, and so on. So to fill this country, we had to have immigrants. We had to have people come in. And so from the time that we were founded, um, we welcomed immigrants and we worked hard 
to make them feel welcome. And I, and I think despite flaws, despite some problems, the reality is that for the average American, um, if you say, I'm an American citizen, it doesn't matter where you came from, doesn't matter what your color is, uh, your, your religion, anything, you are, you are accepted. And to us, this is our religion. This is, this is our religion, that, that the past is gone, you're now an American. So forget where you came from, forget all that, because you are now an American. And so then that mentality means that you don't look back, you look forward. Um, and that is the opposite of, of what happens in other parts of the world, where they, they value their traditions, they value the fact that they may have lived in, in, in the same house, the same family for five, six, seven centuries. They value that tremendously. And so this is a great difference in view. And, and it shows up not just uh, with uh, uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, I can tell you, uh, for example, in Vietnam, um, we would uh, find some village that was producing uh, a large amount of rice, more than they needed, and, and we thought it was probably going to the Viet Cong, the North Vietnamese. Uh, and so we would just arbitrarily take those people uh, from that village en masse and move them 100 kilometers somewhere else where maybe the rice didn't grow as well, but we would give them some bags of rice to make up for it. Mm -hmm. And so they would be forced to leave the house where maybe generations of their family had lived, where all their, their ancestors were buried. In one day, they all had to leave. And when you look back to why we lost the war, this is also one of the reasons that we, we didn't show the respect uh, for the past that we needed to do. So that's more. Taj motiv dovoljno je ovo učvrstili. Je li možda, krenimo dakle na one sadržaj koji će biti našim gledateljima posebno interesantni, to razlog da se u Dejtonu napravi ovakav sporazum, a ne možda neki drugačiji ili bolje. Ili da budem za Hrvate još izazovniji. Da recimo Tuđman ustrajao na nekom trećem entitetu, da nije ili da kažem blaže, da nije pristao na federaciju, Mislite li da bi SAD samo da je dovoljno dugo na tome izistirao, to prihvatile? All right, let me say first of all, I thought about the war a lot. If there was ever a chance to stop the war, mm -hmm. it was before it started. We, we had CIA reports from two years earlier. They were totally accurate as to what would happen if Yugoslavia broke up. We knew what would happen. The world knew what would happen, and yet nobody in the United States, nobody in the European Union, nobody at all was willing to commit to providing troops in advance and saying, okay, if you want to break up, um, here's how it'll be done, and it'll be done peacefully, otherwise our troops will come in. Nobody was willing to do that. And that was a time when I really think uh, there was any chance of stopping what happened. I think uh, at Dayton, uh, it was a, well, first of all, uh, Croatia, sorry to say, made a huge mistake in going to war with the Muslims. That was a huge mistake. Uh, you lost a lot of goodwill on the, on the part uh, of the world, rightly or wrongly for that. But more importantly, uh, the West then forced Croatia and the Muslims to join together in this federation to fight the war. Um, and then comes Dayton, and uh, once again, Croatia is forced into this federation, which I think was a great mistake. I think that it would have been far better to have 
three totally separate entities. Um, but I'm not sure that that would have actually led to uh, a, it would have led to a fairer solution for the Croats, but whether it would have brought peace to, to Bosnia, I doubt it. I think the uh, Dayton peace agreement was totally flawed from the beginning. It had no chance of success. Why? Is it possible to bring peace ikako donijeti ali moguće tu u Bosnu ikako očuvati Well see the pro the, the the problem is that none of the three ethnic groups mm -hmm. uh, believe that they lost the war they all maintain exactly their same beliefs uh, they didn't change them at all um, and so at Dayton they're all treated as equals and um, so the resulting agreement is impossible to ever uh, realize. And the best proof of that is that this was 25 years ago, and you still have a high representative in Bosnia. You still have the ethnic groups who feel very strongly about each other. Uh, I went to, to uh, uh, Mostar a few years ago with a group of American businessmen who uh, were going to look at the restored old bridge that had been blown down during the war by Croatian forces. And we had a very, very nice uh, Croatian guide, woman guide from, from Mostar there. And I asked her, um, what do your friends think about this new bridge? And she said, uh, they haven't seen it yet. I said, what do you mean they haven't seen it yet? We don't go there uh, because that's Muslim territory. So there still is huge tensions all over Bosnia. And God help me, but I don't, I don't see the solution. očito da ni mi ništa u ovom podnevlju naučimo od povijesti kako je Čerčil rekao, od duše samo se jedna uvijek polovica te rečenice citira ona o tome da Balkan proizvodi previše povijesti. Da. A onda ide zarez, pa je Čerčil nastavio jer i drugi proizvode previše povijesti. Kad uzmemo Njemce i Francuze, oni su yeah. prepere proizveli previše za cijeli kontinent. Ali onda ide zarez, pa Čerčil kaže čemu su svjedočanstvo preširoka groblja. Dakle, previše žrtava. Niko ovdje ništa nauči iz prošlosti. Pogledajte sada nestabilna Bosna, ali što se događa između Srba i Kosova, dakle, na Kosovu? Što se događa u Crnoj gori? Bojite li se vi, vi ste tamo na krajnjem jugu Hrvatske, toliko ste dugo ovdje da ste već Hrvat, Hrvat zapravo, evo. Da. Bojite li se vi obnove nekakvih oružanih sukoba, ali mislite da ovaj put to međunarodna zajednica ne bi dozvolila. I, I am very afraid mm. because uh, all of these questions, whether it's Bulgaria fighting with Macedonia over a, a long dead person from the past and, and whether he was Bulgarian or Macedonian and, or the fights between uh, the Kosovo Albanians and the Serbs, or the fights in, in, in Montenegro now uh, over the church issues, or whatever you want to say about uh, Bosnia. All these issues have not been resolved. And, and the problem is that the attention of the world has gone away. In the 1990s, I think uh, this was the number one spot in the world uh, that people looked at, that our leaders focused on. Now they don't. They, they aren't focusing on these. And, and the fact of it is that I don't think these countries can resolve their issues by themselves. I think that uh, the feelings on all sides are so strong that uh, I don't think uh, they can be resolved. I, I, I will tell you, very quickly uh, something that you might not know. But when I was uh, uh, nominated to go to Bulgaria as ambassador, um, 
I had to appear be before Senator Biden. Uh, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee had to confirm uh, my nomination. And one of the questions that he asked me was, what do you think about this new Bulgarian constitution that bans the mention of uh, Macedonians? And I said, I don't think that's, that's good. I think that, that that needs to be changed. So this was the headline in all the newspapers the next day. And there was an effort made before I even got to Bulgaria to declare me persona non grata because I said just that sentence. And that is exactly the same issue that now, something like 30, 35 years later, they're still fighting over. Da, kao i Grčka, kad govorite o Makedoniji, yeah. borila se za to svoje ime zbog, eto, Grčkog pogleda na samo ime. E, recite mi iskreno, nisam mislio pitati, ali moram. Kad gledate vi ovaj, kao amerikanac i diplomat i kao čovjek koji yeah. je sretao širno svijeta, jako puno različitih ljudi, pogotovo diplomaciji, naučili ste se eto, govoriti s oprezom, tri put promisliti vrlo što kažete, što vi mislite o nama ovdje u ovom podneblju kad eto, proizvodimo i nakon ovakvog iskustva tako nevjerovatne stvari? A samo da ovo pitanje dobije još veću težinu. Gledajte, nakon 45. da vam je neko rekao da će postojati konc logori u Evropi, jel biste vjerovali? Yeah. Srebrnica? Yeah. Pa ne mi Hrvati ne smijemo bježati od naših logora. Ja. Yeah. Dakle, yeah. mislim yeah. na ove u yeah. domovinskom ratu, na onaj, onaj druge ovoga, ne da je Bože, ne da pomislim. Hoću kazati, kako gledate uopće na narode i na države koje su ovdje? Jesmo li mi po vama uopće u stanju <laughs> živjeti u miru? <laughs> well, you know... Uh... Imate sad ovaj koncept srpski svijet. Gledajte, neko bi mislio da su Srbi nešto naučili. Tu su ipak gubili ratove, bez obira na Republiku Srpsku, vi ste ih bombardirali, tako dalje, tako dalje. No, 10-15 godina kasnije, srpski svet. Ali, I have to say that I chose, my wife and I chose, to live in this region. It's, for reasons that I don't know, it's certainly in my blood. And I, I remember to this day, uh, my first diplomatic assignment, uh, going to Rome, buying a little Fiat, smallest they had, and uh, driving to a ferry, uh, I think uh, Ancona or Bari or someplace, uh, to Dubrovnik. And waking up the next morning as the ship was docking in Dubrovnik, and I just fell in love with the Brovnik. I just fell in love with it. I couldn't believe it. It was, it, it, for me as an American who hadn't traveled, seeing this was, was fantastic. And that stuck with me. And so years later, when I came back as ambassador, I decided with Lynn that we would retire here. And so we bought this house uh, in Savtat uh, and had it all prepared Uh, for uh, 2000, when, when my mandate was going to be up here. But then I was asked to go uh, to work on Serbia. Uh, and so I, we delayed it for a while. But the point is that the Balkans is in my blood. And I understand the people here and their national feelings. And uh, I think that they are in some ways a little behind um, the other countries of, of Europe in their views of things. Don't forget that, that obviously uh, Germany and France had years, centuries of fighting each other. And it, it took the Second World War for them to decide to stop that. And, and I think that this region will get there too. But, but it will take some more time. But most importantly, it will take help on the part of more than anybody else, the European Union. And sadly to say, they are not providing the sort of assistance and help that they should.
in my view, uh, because this region cannot do it alone. It needs the full support of the West, the US, the EU, <coughs> in order to make these changes over time. Uh, it will happen, but it takes time. Now, you remember the European Union, but when we were talking about the 90s, I took a little bit of a geopolitical analysis, and you turned around me and said, služite se kategorijama 19. stoljeća, jer sam spomenuo toplo more i rusku volju da izađu toplo more. Ali gledajte, 30 godina kasnije, Rusija je prisutna, vrlo zainteresirana, naravno, za ovaj dio. I u Srbiji je prisutna, naravno, i stoji iza nekih aktivnosti u Crnagori i tako dalje, tako dalje. Kad sam bio na Kosovo, razgovarao sam sa ljudima koji vode obeštenu zajednicu, koji su sa vašim ljudima u Americi stalno. Dakle, imam parem te podatke iz prve ruke. Što šta se tu zaostavilo, što je moglo prerasti i preliti se iz države u državu preko Kosova, u Crnu Goru i Crne Gore, u Dubrovnike ili u ovaj dio Hrvatske, što se pripremalo i sa ruske strane. Ali, imamo i Tursku. Hoću kazati, postoji tu i velik interes da ne bude mira dok se ne podijeli ova mala zemljica po ne znam koji put na ne znam kakav način, kao da ležimo na ograničim količinama nafte ili, ne znam, eto, kriptonita. Hoću kazati, ovdje po meni ovaj baš nije sasvim taj mir izvjestan, bez obzira koliko se Europska unija trudila. A možda Europska unija ne može, postoješ da proširim pitanje ništa, jer ona je ekonomski div, ali politički patuljak. Uh, that's so correct, and it's, uh, it's so telling that they are an economic superpower, uh, but they've not been able to translate that into political power because I think they've taken on too many members um, who all have uh, somewhat equal votes. Uh, if they only had eight countries or nine, as they did at the very beginning, uh, it might be easier for them to reach uh, consensus. But when they have as many members as they have now to have consensus on, on any controversial issue, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, as you know, there's four or five members who haven't recognized uh, Kosovo independence yet. Um, there's uh, a lot of unwillingness to expand even further. Uh, and I think this is, this is a, a real problem. Uh, uh, and I'd also say... A hoće li možda administracija predsjednika Bajdena pomoći da se stvari riješe? Jer administracija i politika predsjednika Trumpa je bila sasvim drugačije intonirana. Ne bih htio kazati da je bio nezainteresiran za ovaj dio svijeta, ali mu nije bio odmah u fokusu, je li tako? Yeah. Here's what I think, and I'm sad to say. I think that we made a dramatic uh, overreach in accepting into NATO the countries of the Baltic, uh, among others, to be dangling membership to Georgia uh, and possibly to Ukraine. Um, <coughs> because the reality is that, that the whole fundamental concept of, uh, of NATO is that an attack on one is an attack on all. Oh. Je li to održivo? Je li to i danas tako? Recimo, uh, ne daj Bože da se dogodi da Rusi nešto rade na Baltiku. Biste li vi branili, to jest mi svi zajedno, ali govorim vama kao Amerikancima, yeah. ili Amerika krenula u obranu well, that's, that's the question, because mm -hmm. if the answer is no, that's the end of NATO. On the concept, not the opinion. Yeah, but I, I think we need to go back a little bit, because um, we had a serious threat from the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc uh, in the 60s, the 50s, the 70s, even into the 80s. It was a very serious threat that we all took seriously and we concentrated on that. And that brought a unity to our efforts uh, in NATO and everything else. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, a lot of that fear has gone away uh, because uh, 
uh, Russia of today doesn't have the, the military power uh, that uh, it used to have at all. And so it, it's still uh, a dangerous uh, country in some ways, but it's, it's not the threat it was. And because it's not a threat, um, the countries of, of the EU aren't as willing to do things as they were before. Um, when I was uh, working on these issues uh, in NATO, um, there was one little small office in one small little room mm -hmm. that said, out of area. And there were two people in there. And the whole idea was if they were going to do anything outside of the NATO countries, uh, you know, these two uh, little clerks would figure out what it was, da, 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 da. It wasn't important because they didn't do anything out of area. But then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, and you have NATO in this organization, they started to do some out of area things. And this has not worked out very well at all, as Afghanistan shows, where we tried to work together, but the way we pull out was a disgrace. Uh, and it's gonna make it harder to get any of uh, our NATO allies to do anything else out of area. So I think NATO as a concept uh, basically maybe has run its course, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but uh, the challenge for the, uh, the European Union is uh, if they don't want uh, U.S. leadership and, and uh, support the U.S. in our activities, uh, they're going to need to create an army of their own. And thus far, they've been unwilling uh, to devote the resources to it. And even if they could devote the resources to it, whether they would ever get agreement on taking any action is uncertain. And so that, that is very unfortunate. Uh, Ovdje se kaže, to je na dugom štapu. Europska unija je zaista ove kao nekakva super država koja bi imala nekakvu svoružanu stilu utopija. Kažemo dvije, tri stvari pri recimo Kine ili takovih globalnih heta ovoga odnosa, jer tu sad više niste sami, koliko god mi željeli vas vidjeti ipak kao ona na koje se oslanjamo. Moja obitelj, recimo, to znadete, čak ste me zezali da Kalamazu, ružan grad, je to odlučila još tamo oko 1800, ne znam koje, pa se moja baka rodila, Kalamazu, dobro ste me ovoga tada zavrkavali, ali već ću vam vratiti. No, šalim se. Vi, dakle, sami imate problema danas sa tim da vjerujete kako Amerika i američka demokracija više predstavlja uzor svijetu, jer, tvrdite, postoje dvije Amerike i bojite se za sudbinu demokracije. Vi ste čovjek velikog iskustva, imate svoje godine, eto, radite neke rezime i to nije naprečac impresija nekog, eto, mladog čovjeka koji je sada nakon par nemira odjedan se uplašio. Kako vi vidite tu situaciju SAD-u? Kako vidite to da neko sa rogovima bude u kongresu? Čujte, ja to nisam, ja kao evropljan, ja to nisam mogao, eto, ili kao čovjek koji živi u socijalizmu do 28. Nisam mogao zamisliti da bi se tako nešto moglo u Americi desiti. I have to tell you, I spent 35 years. Da vas pocijem. Yes. I spent 35 years as a diplomat. And I can say very few worked as hard as I did, believed in America as much as I did, and tried very hard uh, in every country I was in to present America positively, thinking that we, we had the right course. I couldn't be a diplomat today because I no longer oh. believe that, that uh, the American way is necessarily the right way, that the democratic system we have is correct uh, for the world at all. I can't say that. 
uh, we have two Americas uh, divided almost equally. Um, and they are divided on about uh, eight or nine different uh, issues on which people are very fierce and angry on both sides. Now, uh, to say something very undiplomatic, I would like to take uh, all of these Republicans that uh, are against uh, 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 any controls on guns, uh, against abortion, uh, against uh, progress made by women in the military and other areas, uh, uh, on progress on gays. Take all these people, build a gigantic time machine, put them all in this gigantic time machine, and send them back to 1950, because they would be really happy in 1950 America, you know, where none of these issues came up. And I'm, I'm making a joke, but, but the, no, tru no. The, the truth is that, that half of America is scared to death about the future and a lot of things. Uh, as I was growing up uh, in a small town in Pennsylvania, uh, the big deal was if your father uh, worked in one of the factories in town, uh, it was great because he had a job for life and he would have the influence so his son can get a job there too. That was the extent of their, their desire. That factory is long closed now. Uh, it's a new world. We have uh, laptops, computers, smartphones, everything, new technology. Young people understand this. The older people don't understand it. Uh, we have uh, a real problem with climate change uh, that we have to deal with. And um, at the same time in America, there are more homes being built in areas subject to flooding oh. than being built in other areas uh, because there's a resistance to believe that these things are real. And this, these two Americas are preventing us from doing anything. On almost any issue you can name, there is a total blockage, uh, as you may see uh, even this week. Everybody agrees we should have a, a, a bill to improve our infrastructure. All the polls show 80% of the people believe this, all parties. But we can't get this close because of this two America fight. It's, it's a very real problem. It's getting worse. I'm afraid for our democracy. And I'm afraid it's not just America, by the way. Uh, it's, it's happening all over the world. Uh, it's happening certainly in, in Britain. Uh, I think it's going to happen now in Germany. After. In Central Europe? Yeah. In Germany, you think? Yes. Why? Uh, because Merkel is gone, and I don't think the leader who will take her place will have the strength, and it's going to be... But you have only... You have... It showed that the large political parties, the political ideas, are not ready. The SPD has shown that. We have talked about the last 10-15 years about how social democracy is in Europe in crisis. The Germany has shown, even in the same success, that it is not. Unija je nešto loše prošla iz sasvim konkretnih razloga, ali i to je onako jedna masivna državna povijesna stranka. Vi imate zapravo samo AFD koji je tu problematičan, on nije problematičan, ali prije zbog nekih figura koje su potpuno iluđaci, a ne misli sad pravdati njihov program, ali mogao bi zamisliti pacificirani AFD. Mislite da i Njemačka je jednako tako u krizi? Ja, ne znam. I'm not an expert on Germany. I'm not sure, but I can say that in a lot of other countries it's happening. And here's the danger. Uh, when it's happening in America and others, um, basically at a certain point, people are going to get fed up with this system which isn't working. And they will look to have a more autocratic system That's the danger. That's what I worry about in America and in some other countries as well. And they will look to China and they, they will see, well, 
things are working pretty well in China. Yes, we have capitalism and we need to be a democracy and things work. Exactly. Here we are a few minutes to the end of the mission, and you are here in Croatia. Kako vam se čini hrvatska situacija, kako vam se čini današnja politička garnitura? Svi su ljudi eto, na čelu države, ne samo evo, danas, nego već drugu, treću generaciju. I Sanader je bio i predsjednica Kolinda, Grabar Kitarović, današnji predsjednik Milanović, naravno premijer Plenković je tekako čovjek Evrope. Kako vam se čini da dakle, ogate situaciju u kojoj Hrvatsku imate mlade ljude europskog političkog iskustva, I je li Hrvatska puno bolja nego što je bila kad ste od nje izlazili? Well, first of all, let me say congratulations to Croatia for joining the European Union, for joining NATO, for having a great highway system, for building this Pelješac Bridge, which is fantastic, and for having a tourism sector, which the whole world knows about and appreciates. So, so you've done a lot of very good things. Um, I would just say, with all due respect, that tourism actually is a, what I would say is a two-edged sword. Because on the one hand, it's bringing in a tremendous amount of money for Croatia. But on the other hand, there is not the drive, there's not the, the fierce need to develop other sectors. And so those sectors are not, I, I think, being developed at the same rate. And for that reason, I think you've got a drain of talented young people that are going to other places in the European Union. And uh, my, my one hope is that that uh, Croatia would spend uh, more money, perhaps some of the money earned from tourism, on other sectors of the country, getting more foreign investment, getting more private investment uh, and support for private investment. Uh, you still, I think, have more state uh, factories and, and industries than you need uh, than other countries in the European Union have. So you have some work that you can do there to make it even better. But again, uh, you've made tremendous progress and you see it in a lot of little ways. The, the EU, uh, for all of its uh, faults, uh, with all of its teeny tiny little regulations on this or that, actually it works. Vi i vaša gospođa živite, naravno ovdje, kad dođe vaša kćer, je li razmišlja i ona možda o Hrvatskoj kao zemlju u kojoj bi živjela. Da, yes. Yeah? Yes, she, uh, she lives in, in London now. She's lived there, she's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, she's lived there for 17 years. Uh, but because of COVID, uh, she actually came back and she uh, lived with us for about uh, three months working remotely. Uh, she's gone back to settle things and she hopes to come back here as a digital nomad. And to je recimo put da ti digitalni nomad, IT industrija i svi ti mladi ljudi koji yeah. mogu i znaju drugačije nego mi koji svodimo račune. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Well, the interesting thing for her is so she's she's an attorney. Uh, she has clients. She uh, has a Zoom call on her laptop. She meets a client for the first time via Zoom call. They agree if they're going to work together or not. They come up with a strategy. Uh, they meet with the opponent's lawyers on a Zoom call. And then at the end of the day, they have a Zoom call with the judge mm -hmm. who, who is on the computer along with everybody else making the decision. So the whole process has become by remote. Now, I'm not saying that every job can do that, but uh, Amelia is looking to be back here and she's looking at buying something uh, somewhere close to us. Eto, to je izvrsna preporuka kad uh, Iksher, višeg veleposlanika SAD-a u Hrvatskoj želi postati, dakle, ovoga Hrvatica. 
gdje ćete boj preporuku. Gospodin Montgomer, ja se samo mogu nadati da ćemo se vidjeti još koji put. Hvala vam lijepo, želim vam prekrasan život u Hrvatskoj na našem divnom jugu i do nekog sljedećeg susreta, do vidjenja. I thank you very much and let me also say I want to thank uh, the Croatian government for allowing us the uh, privilege of, of, of being here. Dragi gledatelji, hvala lijepo što ste bili sa nama. Naravno, gledajte nas i sljedećeg puta. Do srijede, do vidjenja.